Welcome to the 21st Edelman Trust Barometer. Um, this has been a year like no other. Before I get into the data, let me try to describe some of the important changes over the last 21 years. We started the Trust Barometer after the battle in Seattle um, when the World Trade Organization meeting was stormed by anti-globalization protesters. And we sought to understand the role of NGOs in global governance. And we decided to look at business, government, media, and NGOs in terms of trust. NGOs were the most trusted institution in the world. The second big finding over time was the rise of a person like yourself, that trust, instead of being from the top down, became horizontal, peer to peer. The third big finding was after the Great Recession, uh, it, but it took about three years um, until 2012, was the mass class divide, which came up in the US, UK, and France first, leading to populist revolts um, that you saw electoral change. And so, in fact, going into uh, this uh, study this year, um, we actually had done a study in uh, the spring. And so I will show you that result now. You'll remember that the most trusted institution as of May was government. Um, it, it actually, for the first time, was the most trusted. It was wartime conditions during the lockdown. Government was seen as the most powerful force. And in fact, the rest of society in a certain way kept its head down, especially business. And so what we see though is in the most recent data, trust in government has cratered that uh, in fact, massive declines uh, in trust in government. So government is no longer the most trusted institution. That goes to business. For the first time, business is at the top by itself. So before, we saw that business was tied with NGOs last year as of January. What we see today is business alone at the top, the most trusted institution, ahead of government in 20 of the 28 countries that we studied. We find that this chart is the most relevant to describe why. Business is seen as deeply competent, but also increasingly ethical. Appreciate that we now see a 50 point gap between business and government, and that's the largest we've seen. We also now see business getting closer to NGOs in terms of being seen as ethical players. So business has definitely benefited from fast discovery of vaccines and also return to work in a safe manner. Trust has also gone local. In the last two years, we have seen that my employer is actually the most trusted institution in the world. 15 points ahead of business, 25 points ahead of government. It places significant responsibilities on business, new responsibilities to be a credible information source. There's a trust reckoning this year's data for both China and the United States. Since May, trust in China by its own respondents has cratered 18 points. It's cost China the top position for the first time in several years. So despite the quite strong and capable reaction to the virus, trust in China has dropped, especially in business, 25 point drop since May. The saddest story of the year is my own country, the United States. The US is now third from the bottom, according to our most recent data from December. We find that the US is only above Russia and Japan. Japan still dragging because of Fukushima almost a decade after that disaster. So let's get to the United States in particular. We've seen a trust crash among Trump voters since the election. American trust was not high in November, but today it is dragged down by the Trump voters, particular drops about trust in NGOs, in government, and in media. Note the 40 point delta between a Biden voter and a Trump voter about trust in media. The most powerful countries in the world have lost trust capital according to our study this year. The United States over seven years has gone from 62% to 48% trust in companies headquartered in the US. 
In terms of percentage trust in the national government of each foreign country, China is at the very bottom of the list. China is distrusted by almost everyone in the world uh, in terms of its national government. Higher in Asia than in the rest of the world. The US at 40% is the lowest number we've seen. I've talked about the mass class divide for eight years now. It is now transversal. It started in the US, in the UK, and in France. Today, in almost every one of the countries, we see double digit trust gaps. When people say that the populist bubble was burst in November, that's wrong. It is not so. And there are reasons behind it. In particular, accelerated fears, not just about job loss, but of downward economic uh, and position and also fear on personal health. So almost 20 points in India, Saudi Arabia, et cetera. This is a disease that is spreading. The pandemic has added to personal and societal fears. Job loss, big jump in concern because people have seen people losing their jobs. Climate change has risen substantially in terms of the fear. Also cyber hacks. COVID actually, interestingly, is the fourth of the problems. Now we get to the meat of the problem. We have, ladies and gentlemen, not just a pandemic, but an infodemic. It starts with the idea that our leaders are liars, that societal leaders are not trusted to do what's right. Trust is only high among those who are close to me. Either people in my local community or my employer CEO and in scientists, even if scientists diminished from 80 percent to 73, still the highest. Who's not trusted to do what's right? Everyone from CEOs all the way down to government leaders. Societal leaders are suspected of actually putting forth misinformation, intentionally trying to deceive us knowing that they are saying false things, both business and government leaders. And we really distrust our information sources. Search is the highest, but it's no compliment to say that we've had a nearly 10 point drop in two years. It's even worse for traditional media, down 12 points in, in those two years. Social media continues to bring up the bottom. It is at new lows at 35% trust. So we don't trust who's speaking and we don't trust the information sources either. This is a shocker. Employer media is the most believable. In other words, a corporate newsletter or publication is more believable than the national government, mainstream media or social media. Now, the consequence of this is actually serious we see serious vaccine hesitancy. Only one third of respondents told us that they're prepared to get vaccinated immediately. Another one third within a year, but one third say, I don't wanna be vaccinated at all. I am afraid of the speed with which the vaccines were developed, or I don't believe my national government, or I have a long history of being treated badly by national health systems because I'm a person of color and Tuskegee and these sorts of historical problems. Poor information hygiene definitely threatens the pandemic recovery. There is a significant delta between those who practice so-called good information hygiene, which means looking at multiple sources of information and not sharing something that they can't prove to be so. Um, it's 11 point delta. Uh, about um, getting vaccinated. And it's particularly problematic in the UK, Spain, the US, and in France. Now to the expectations of business. As the most trusted institution in the world, take a look at the necessity of business stepping into the void left by government. CEOs, don't wait for government. Take the lead on change, on systemic racism, on jobs and, and retraining, on infrastructure, on sustainability, CEOs to hold themselves accountable to the general public and not just to shareholders. Step in when government can't fix problems. Speak up on societal issues. 
For example, I said this morning in the Wall Street Journal that business is going to have to be the connective tissue in the United States between the two quarreling parties, that we have work to be done on automation, on pandemic. We've got to get people vaccinated. CEOs lead on societal issues. And this is amazing. You'll remember that there are four important parts of building trust in institutions. Ability, dependability, integrity, and purpose. But specifically, what people want most from business right now, and the thing that makes trust jump, guard information quality. We're scared. We don't have the facts. Also, embrace sustainable practices. Almost equal. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've declared information bankruptcy. How are we going to emerge from the bankruptcy situation? First, business has to embrace its broader mandate. It's not natural for business to be an information source. It's not natural for CEOs to stick their heads up in a time of high controversy. But we have to change that learned behavior. Now is the moment for business to step into the void. Again, on sustainability, systemic racism, jobs and upskilling, act first, talk later. Do something like Yum Brands, provide money for African-Americans to become franchisees, not just store managers. Give them the capital to get ahead. Second, lead with facts and act with empathy. Specifically, we must make sure that societal leaders use straight talk. No more disinformation, but also address people's fears. And these are real fears of downward mobility, of job loss, of personal sickness. Third, we think that the media is the fundamental partner in truth. However, the media cannot do it alone. If the other three institutions are not adding quality information to the dialogue, and business in particular must intervene if there is falsehood in social. Fourth, I'm nervous about business going it alone. I think it's a mistake, for example, for business to be mandating vaccine must partner with government. The idea of partnership is so much stronger than solo player. I conclude today with a quote from George Orwell, which I think is particularly relevant. Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two makes four. If that is granted, all else follows. Jillian Tett will take it from here. Thanks, Jill. Thank you, Richard, for those comments, and um, great to be part of this discussion today. I think, as many of you know, I've had the pleasure of taking part in the World Economic Forum discussion at Davos about this discussion now for several <coughs> years. But I must say that this year's, I think, is perhaps the most fascinating and momentous discussion around the Edelman survey that I've seen. That's partly because the survey results are shocking and challenging um, for almost everyone who's watching this call, including, indeed, especially those in the media. Secondly, because we do live, indeed, at momentous and challenging times. Um, we've seen one sign of that in the events in Washington in recent days, but that's just part of a bigger zeitgeist shift in a very volatile and uncertain world. Another sign of this extraordinary zeitgeist shift is the explosive growth in environmental, social and governance issues during the last year that we've been tracking very closely at the Financial Times through things like Moral Money Platform. And the other reason why I'm so delighted to be chairing this panel this morning is because we have a truly terrific collection of people to talk about these issues today, reflecting almost all of the spheres which are so much on the front pages right now and in people's minds. We have Ruth Porat, who is a senior vice president and CFO of Alphabet and Google, who I'm going to be asking questions about questions to in a minute about the question of social media and what the companies are doing in that respect. We have Derek Johnson, who's a president and CEO of the NAACP, who has been absolutely center stage in the debate about racism in America during the last year. 
We have Jane Sun, who's CEO from Trip.com Group, who joined us from China, who can give us a wonderful Asian perspective. We have Stéphane Boncel, who's the CEO of Moderna Therapeutics, who can talk to, talk to us about the pharmaceutical industry and those very chilling data points that Rich just highlighted in terms of vaccine competence. And we have Dr. David Navarro, who is Special Envoy for COVID-19 with the World Health Organization, who's been working in this arena for many years and can talk to us both about the vaccine question and also about trust in NGOs in general. So let me start perhaps with Ruth, because the question of what tech companies are doing right now um, and how much trust there is in government, business and media is absolutely centre stage, given what's happening in Washington. In fact, just this morning, we saw that YouTube has taken down the videos um, are from Donald Trump. Can you tell us, are you surprised by the findings of this year's Edelman survey? And can you share any reflections on what that means for a company like Google and Alphabet? Thank you, Jillian, and thank you, Richard. It's great to be here and great to be here with this extraordinary panel. You know, I would say like every year when I, I read the trust report, what we see is data that codifies, quantifies what we're living and feeling. Yeah. And um, it's so profound this year. You know, the U.S. government has let us down. You see that in the COVID data. You see this in the assault on Washington. And to see those numbers, truly tragic. But um, we're we're living it, and, and so not a surprise. I would say that at Google, our view has been for quite some time that it's our responsibility to step in and do what we can on these key issues and for our users and for our community. And you see that, for example, with COVID. When COVID, when we saw the first signs of COVID breaking through, we established a billion-dollar program uh, so that we could work with authoritative sources like the World Health Organization and other NGOs to amplify their voice. We put money behind small, medium businesses because we knew they would be the most stressed going through COVID and the economic issues around COVID. So our view was we do need to play a leadership role. And I would say when I looked at the data, you know, it, it's, it was encouraging to see that search engines yet again are the most trusted among information sources. But as Richard said, when we look at how the decline over the last couple of years, it's it, that that is a cause of concern. And I would say part of that reflects the toxicity in society generally, but that is not an excuse. We Each of us needs to do more where we can to help break through with quality information and play the role that we can. And the last thing I would say, I think it was very important, Richard um, ended on this note that we can't go it on our own. And again, pointing to COVID, you know, the fact in the U.S. that this concept that masks were political is so absurd, um, so offensive and so dangerous. And yet, as we at Google were trying to elevate not just our voice and authoritative information around prevention from the spread of COVID and working with players like the World Health Organization, we're working against this current of the inf disinformation coming right out of Washington. And so the concept of working together, we do need to have alignment and work together with other businesses and government if we're able to break through. And we do view that as a core part of how we can deliver for our users, for our communities, make sure we're elevating authoritative voices and pull down bad content, block it from ever getting out in the, in the open. Right. Well, thank you, Ruth. I should say that we already have questions pouring in. We have an enormous number of people watching from around the world, which shows how hot these questions, these topics are. Many of these questions do relate to social media. So, Ruth, brace yourself. I'm going to come back to you and throw some of these at you in a little bit. But before we do, I'd like to bring in Derek. Um, we have seen this really cataclysmic gap between the um, public's perception, general public's perception of trust and the um, informed public's perception of trust. Issues about racism, issues about inclusion or the lack of it um, have clearly fostered and fueled this. Derek, can you share us some thoughts about whether you're surprised by the results of this study and what does it mean for businesses as they try and address this issue of systemic racism? Thank you and great, great question. 
you know, like many of you, I grew up, the information source was stagnant. It was the encyclopedia. It was the nightly news. And now that information and news, it has been so democratized without any guardrails to determine what's facts and what are not facts. And it's driven so much by individuals who are pushing a narrative that's in their uh, economical best interest and not in the interest of the greater society. And when you overlay that with the tool of race in the United States, racism has been an effective tool to drive uh, political outcomes, particularly in the regional South of the United States. Now it's such a national problem. Uh, we create a level of uh, instability in the in the business climate, in the political climate, in the climate in where individuals feel safe and they feel that they their prospects for the future is secure. We're not surprised. We began to ring this bell of concern over four years ago, and I've been in this position three years, and, and we launched a campaign uh, 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 because one of the social media platforms refused to address the necessity of guardrails to keep people safe and to protect our democracy. Stop Pay for Profit was a campaign we launched with some of our partner organizations, Anti-Defamation League, Color of Change, because we begin to see the trend line, whether it was Charlottesville, Virginia, or the attack on the synagogue in Pittsburgh, or the church in South Carolina, that individuals were being coerced through information sources that were not factual to take on actions that was against their interests. That's not a good climate for any of us, and it's definitely not a climate for business growth. And in order for us to get in front of this, we need to diversify our ability to have more decision makers at the table that look more like the customer base that exists and a customer base that you want to grow into. And if we do that effectively, we could begin to curb the spread of, of information that's not factual. One final point, whenever we politicize uh, issues around our public health, we put everyone at risk. Wearing a mask should not be a political reality. Whenever we politicize the administration of our democracy, like who can go vote and how they are able to cast their ballot, we put our democracy at risk. And that's not just in the United States, that's around the globe. And th that level of instability uh, and, and consumer behavior will soon germinate and impact the ability of corporations to truly predict their ability to, uh, to, to gain profit. And so it's incumbent upon the business community to help restore a level of trust around factual information, identify what are the sources. I mean, for me, it was my encyclopedia and how we are being inclusive and determining what should, what is a part of the political discourse and what is not political, what is about a nature of stability, safety, and our public health. Well, that's fascinating. So I'm um, basically the one of the best ways to counter the distortions of false information is to have real life people who represent the diversity of views and opinions and lived experiences at the table to actually talk about what is or is not really happening. And I think that's a point which will challenge anyone who's watching from a corporate perspective. Um, but let me bring in Jane at this point, um, who has a very interesting perspective on this, because Essentially, not only are we all desperate to know if and when we can all start traveling again and actually having a holiday or even doing business travel, but also Asia in many ways has, a, um, has emerged so much better from this pandemic than the West. And yet in places like China, there is a low level of public trust. So I'm curious to ask you, Jane, how do you interpret the results of the survey this year? And once again, remember to unmute. <laughs> By the way, if you're having problems with the mute button, just remember Macron and Justin Trudeau and everyone else has had problems with it as well in recent days, so you're not alone. Thanks for your question. Uh, in Asia, I think there are three major factors that played a very important role in the fight against the pandemics. First of all, uh, in Asia, our teaching is very highly uh, influenced by Confucius. So when we grow up, kids are taught, not only you need to take care of the best interest of you, yourself, individual, but also we need to pay attention to the best interest of our community, our country, and the rest of the world. Uh, so uh, this time when we uh, 
or going through the pandemics, we immediately established the 2 billion natural disaster relief fund to help our customers. We also established a 10 billion small, medium sized loan to help our partners. And in the community, uh, people were really uh, watching out to help each other during this crisis. The second thing Asia did very well is really paying attention and pay lots of respect to the scientists and experts. Uh, when we were uh, listening to their speech, uh, we we're following their instruction and also their suggestion. Uh, the scientists who were leading through uh, the breakthrough of the medical field are very well respected. They are the authority almost uh, in leading the fight of the pandemics. The third one that works very well is that because of the density of the population in Asia, we have been through many uh, pandemics. Uh, for example, in 1999, we fought against the SARS. And these small outbreaks in the past really helped the community to develop a habit in case there's a crisis. What is the best way we can do? Uh, for example, isolation in this case works very well. It's ancient, but it works very well. So the highly disciplined uh, way uh, in fighting and a break out the spread of the pandemic is very important in the fight against the pandemics in Asia. Thank you very much indeed. Those are great points. And I'd say I think many people in the West would only wish that they had the same level of both government organization in terms of combating the vaccine, for combating COVID-19, but also the same level of public trust and acceptance of the vaccine, which seems like a great moment to bring in Stefan, who is at the forefront of efforts to build public trust in vaccines and in medical science. Um, tell us, are you surprised by the results of the survey? And what on earth can companies like yourself do to actually counter the extraordinarily high levels of mistrust we see in the Edelman report? Well, hello. Uh, Richard, Gillian, thank you for, for having me. So uh, I'm not surprised. I mean, we should not forget first that there are a lot of people who can't wait to get a vaccine. And you can see it on TV daily, uh, you know, people in their chairs, in their cars waiting to get vaccinated. So we, I think should start by the positive side of things. Then, of course, we have the anti-vaxxer, uh, which have existed for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, this is not using science. Our logic, so it's kind of tough to solve for those. But indeed, what we have seen this year with this vaccine is a third category of people that are on the fence. Uh, and if you look at the data and you, you ask them why are they on the fence, because they used to not be anti-vaxxers, they tell you, uh, and I think it's what Richard was saying, the infodemic is a big issue. There are so many uh, awful information uh, on the internet, on social media, videos you know, theories that Bill Gates has created the virus so that you can, you know, with a vaccine, put a chip in your body, just like your crazy things. Uh, and the other piece is the politicization. We unfortunately happen to be developing a vaccine during a, uh, an election year, which, as we all know, uh, was not helpful. It was totally politicized. So the entrepreneur optimist in me thinks that the, the group on the fence is going to move to vaccination for most of them in the next six to 12 months. Uh, and, and I think for, for a few reasons, I mean, first, they're gonna start seeing that people getting vaccines are not gonna drop dead in the street uh, or grow a second head or something like this. So, and, and, and the cases are gonna continue to people not vaccinated. Uh, and so I think people are gonna, over time, realize that uh, getting a vaccine is a good idea. Getting back to a normal life is what we all want uh, to happen. And again, the optimistic in me uh, says that it's actually not so bad that we have people on the fence. As you know, we don't have enough vaccines for everybody. Uh, this is going to last for several months. And so if you have a few people saying, please go in front of me, and then they'll join the party a bit later, it actually might be a bit better. Uh, what we've tried to do is a few things as a company. First is to partner with trusted voices. You know, we've partnered with Dr. Tony Fauci to develop this vaccine. Uh, every time we could, we let Tony be the one talking about the data because he has the trust of the public. Uh, he is a clinician. I am not a clinician. 
I'm a business person. I have a lot of clinicians in my team, but I'm not a clinician personally. And I think it is not appropriate for me as a CEO, not being a clinician to talk about clinical data. So using Tony for him to be in the forefront to talk about the data and then things like, you know, Tony got vaccinated with all vaccine over the Christmas break, which is another kind of slow proof of, of trust into the vaccine. The other piece we, we've done, and it goes back to what Richard was saying around transparency. Corporations have an incredible role to play in terms of transparency, uh, and it, we just need to all raise the bar. And what we ask ourselves the question as a team is, what would we want to see if we were not in the company? I think too often in the old world, uh, executives want to do what's easier for them or feel safer. And we didn't ask ourselves that question. When we started the big phase three study at the end of July, we said if we were not in Moderna, what would we want to know to trust the data? And so we started to publish on a weekly basis our enrollment rate. And some weeks we had good weeks, and some weeks we had bad weeks, and it was out there on social media every Friday. Uh, in August, we were not pleased with the minority recruitment we had. The African American numbers were not good enough. The Hispanic number were pretty good, but not the African American for a very simple historical reason is that there was a lack of trust, very strong lack of trust because of awful things that have been done to that community, you know, years ago through clinical study by the government. And so what we decided to do is to slow down the study and we told sites, clinical sites, you need to get more African American in the study or we, we, we don't want more, you know, white people in the study. We have plenty of those. And we took a hit on the timeline to launch. And it was a very big decision for us because we knew, you know, we were head to head with Pfizer. Uh, we started the clinical trial by accident on the same day, on July 27. And we knew that slowing down was going to impact the time of launch. But again, we said with the team, look, we worked so hard for 10 years to develop this technology. We worked so hard for, you know, a year nonstop to get this vaccine because every day matters. If we get this vaccine approved, and you know, African Americans don't want to take it. Hispanic don't want to take it. Asian, we will have failed. Those are the communities that have been the most impacted by this virus because of the jobs they do, because of the lack of healthcare they have. And we say we will have failed. Uh, and you know, we're in this business, thankfully, to help people. And so we right. decided to do something that seems counterintuitive business-wise, but was the right thing to do if we play the long game. I think in today's world, more and more executives are realizing that. We are part of a solution. We have to be part of a solution in the world. We build communities. We live in communities. You know, we're based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We have a plant in Massachusetts. I always tell our employees, you know, if you don't engage in the community, don't expect to have a good community. We have a role to play. We should not uh, assume things falling from the sky for us. And in terms of engagement, we need to do it. So I think transparency has been really important for us. Another maybe last comment is. Usually pharmaceutical companies do not publish phase three clinical trial. And we say that makes no sense. Everybody is questioning how is our study run? So let's do something that is pretty easy. We put the PDF totally unredacted of a protocol of a clinical trial as was approved by the FDA. We didn't change one word and we put it online. It has never been done in the industry, but again, we said Look, it is what it is. Uh, we just should put it out there. It will help the trust and the credibility. And we are very pleased that within eight hours, uh, very large pharmaceutical companies decided to do the same. And uh, this was first in the industry. Right. Well, thank you. That's fascinating. So key themes around radical transparency, um, or at least a lot more transparency in the past, partnerships with others, be that Anthony Fauci or others, and then trying to get engaged in the local community. And to pick up on the point that Derek made so forcefully, getting people around the table who actually represent the community that they're actually part of and have real life people trying to counter online misinformation, if you like. Um, I'm curious, I'd like to bring David in at this point, Dr. David Navarro, because you've been working with the WHO for many, many years, trying to foster more trust. That's been very challenged during the pandemic. Tell us how it looks from your perspective and whether you were surprised by the results of the Edelman survey this year. Thanks very much indeed. Yep. Um, I'm not really surprised to see trust numbers going up and down. 
Uh, it's not an easy thing these days to be working in uh, the what we call international system, which is the different organizations that are established by world leaders to deal with global issues. I, I want, wanted to spend a couple of minutes. What is the World Health Organization? It is a, an organization full of doctors, uh, nurses, epidemiologists, pathologists, people like me. Uh, it's got about one third of the annual budget of the United States Centers for Disease Control. It does not have authority to go into countries and demand them to hand over things or allow investigations. It has to work through the consent of everybody. And having studied the performance of WHO on this and on other issues, I would say it's it's pretty good uh, within the limitations that the organization has. However, during 2020, about halfway through the year, the representative of the principal stakeholder in WHO, which is the United States government, uh, sent uh, an 18 page letter, uh, 18 um, point letter, basically making a number of accusations against the organization. He didn't send the letter through the usual route, which is through the US ambassador in Geneva. The letter was posted on Twitter. I think it's on the 17th of May and basically said uh, we had really messed up and that we'd spent uh, a lot of time and effort into supporting the government of one of our member states in an inappropriate way. I mean, we are kind of ordinary doctors. We, we are committed to one principle in our work, which is every person in the world has equal value. Every nation in the world has a right to access our services and whatever we can offer to people, we will offer it to all, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, wealth, sexual orientation or the company they work for, whatever else. So this has been a pretty challenging moment because if the major stakeholder in a very public way, uh, either directly or through his Secretary of State, says that we are totally biased and incompetent, it's quite difficult even for the most uh, focused public to say, well, surely there's something in this. Surely they are somehow uh, enthralled to this government or that government. Well, we've continued, uh, Gillian, doing the best we can. Uh, we rely on the information that countries give us. So when we work out where the pandemic is and what's happening, where the variants are changing, uh, where there are good results occurring, this is all coming from national governments because that's how we work. There's a treaty that sets up how we work and we will just continue every day, all hours of the day, producing the best information we can, going through hundreds of scientific papers each day and coming out with the recommendations that we believe are the right ones. I hope that the trust will increase. Uh, I must say that based on my understanding of the kind of people who work for the World Health Organization, I don't think there's any other body in the world that is so credible. Stefan said, we work with Tony Fauci. I would say, as well as working with Tony himself, I have the honor of working with thousands of Tony Fauci's. These are the absolute amazing human beings who guard our public health, who look after us, when we are affected by disease, who are prepared to stand up for what really matters and say to anybody who is doing activities that damage health, we say, please stop. And we, sometimes we do it in private. Getting into Twitter spats with world leaders is not the coolest thing to do, especially if they pay 20% of your budget and your budget is already ludicrously tight for what you're supposed to be doing, but we'll go on. And I hope we can earn back the trust that we've lost because the world needs us right now. This pandemic is swirling and surging in multiple continents. It's going to cause much more misery and suffering before it's finished. There's not enough vaccine available and there's not the will to get that vaccine to the world's poor people and poor countries 
who are the ones who are suffering the most. And we've got to make certain that we stay in the center of the trust viewfinder, because without that, the level of suffering and the level of distress is just going to get worse and worse, because it will not get better before the world is vaccinated. And that will not happen, I don't believe, until well into 2022, because we simply don't have the political support or the cash for the necessary global response to this pandemic that is so vital. Well, thank you, Navarro, for that very fiery and spirited defence, which frankly should, I think, challenge us all and challenge governments. And it truly is a reflection of how peculiar, crazy, terrifying, how VUCA dominated in the sense of volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, to use a military term, how VUCA dominated the world is, that um, at a time of in inferno, people are attacking the um, fire engines, if you like, or one set of the fire engines. Um, very odd times and terrifying times we live in. Um, we have a stream of questions. Um, so I'm going to group them together. And I'm going to start, as I said earlier, by really asking Ruth to comment on the role of social media. Um, I spent quite a bit of time last year talking to some of the Google and Alphabet people who are looking at misinformation on vaccines for a book that I'm writing and was very struck by the difficulty of trying to counter misinformation um, online um, while I was doing that research. But I'm curious, Ruth, many people who are watching might ask, um, have the tech companies not failed to police um, your own platforms properly? Um, are you part of the problem in terms of enabling misinformation to spread? And then on a more positive note, we've got questions asking, for example, what role can social media play in a positive way in helping CEOs becoming more trustworthy? You know, are you part of the solution, not just part of the problem? And then also a very practical question I think people want to ask, which is how will changes in social media trust impact marketing directives in 2021? Do you think expect to see any advertising fallout or revenue fallout from this loss of trust? So, Ruth, those are a bundle of questions, which is merely a summary of all the questions that are flooding in for you. But give us your thoughts on that. Are you part of the problem or part of the solution? And how should people actually view your role today when they're looking at advertising budgets? Yeah, I'm going to start actually with that last question, because in our view, trust is, is so core to everything that we do. So we don't look at this with a lens to what are the implications for revenues. The view is that the right thing to be doing is to ensure that we're protecting the sanctity of the information quality experience um, that people have when they go to search, when they watch a, a YouTube um, video and trust drives what we do. And we invest meaningfully to try and protect the quality of that information. And we do it really in a number of ways. Um, we invest in people to really look at how do we um, elevate authoritative information. But as you know, we also work with NGOs because much of what we're seeing in disinformation in these, in, in bad information um, come, to, come to society through dog whistles that many of us would not be able to discern. And so working with really authoritative experts in these areas who can help us decipher what are the messages coming through is important. And then we invest also in machine learning so that we can rapidly block and take down bad quality uh, information. And so, you know, that that is very much core to the work that we've done in search um, and the way we look at, at what we're doing in YouTube. And, you know, I, I think you can see some of the actions, as you indicated in your opening comments, um, we blocked uh, the Donald Trump channel from uploading um, new videos. And, and the, the reason was, you know, was they're looking, if they're looking to incite violent action, that is, um, that is blocked. I'm sure many people would say that's a low bar. Of course that should be blocked, but that's what we look to block. Um, and any other, any, any misinformation, disinformation that would lead people to um, reach, you know, wrong, wrong conclusion. So this not concept of knowledge panels where we're elevating authoritative information is what we're trying to do to help people understand what is accurate information. And in our view, it is absolutely a responsibility of ours and one of the core areas in which we, we do invest. And I would say that from the data, from our own experience, it, this is a journey that never ends. There are people who, uh, bad actors are, are around the globe, tr constantly trying to subvert 
uh, the quality of information that all of us get. So our view is that this is a continuous battle and therefore the, uh, the, the intensity with which we monitor it um, and, and the v vigilance with which we attack it and the partners with whom we work in order to get at it is core to what we do and we're very committed to continuing that, that work, absolutely. And just one other quick question on this point. We have a very specific question. Google has suspended all contributions um, by its net pack. Can you please share why your company thought that is so important now after last week's capital riots? How did you come to that decision? And we have a stream of questions linked to this about the whole question about polit political donations in general. But I'm curious, specifically looking at Google's decision after the capital riots to suspend all contributions by NetPack, will that be maintained for some time or was that just a symbolic brief gesture? Uh, not symbolic. Uh, it was, you know, it was very serious. We took this action, as did many other companies, when we saw that um, there were members of Congress who were uh, refusing to accept the democratic process, who were, in, in, you know, effectively inciting the type of, um, of assault on the Capitol and on democracy that we saw. We, like others, stepped back and said, this is not working. We've got to figure out what does. And we want to be part of the democratic process, but that not we not support. We, we want to make sure we are not supporting those who are looking to undermine it. And so we, again, like others, stepped back and said, we've got to make sense of this and what our responsible role is. Um, and so it's, it is on hold and everybody's, we're, we're taking a look, uh, I think like others at what makes sense, <clears throat> but not supporting those who are inciting uh, uh, to undermine the democracy. Right. We have a large collection of questions here, which I'd like to put to some of the other panelists about the paradox that um, how can business, embrace their expanded mandate and tr build trust, knowing that they may need to make cuts in tough economic times. How can businesses, if they are regarded as the most trusted um, institutional group of leaders, actually build on that trust? Similar question we have, how can we square the fact that um, business leaders need to step into the void left by government employees with the fact that business leaders are trying to mislead us? Um, lots and lots of questions about what businesses should actually do to respond to the, these um, survey findings. Um, would any of you like to jump in and comment on that? I mean, either Stefan or Jane, um, about yeah. what you think businesses can or could or should do? Sure. Um, I think a lot of turmoil this time caused was because a lot of people were not benefited from the development in the past couple of years uh, for the economic development. Uh, so what we do is really uh, work with the government to lift the poverty level. Uh, for example, when we bring uh, tourists to the popular travel destinations, we really create job opportunities for the women in these poor area, uh, for the people who cannot travel travel far away from their hometown. We create uh, alternative uh, accommodation opportunities, meal opportunities, and by being engaged with the tourist industry, uh, the people living in a remote area really uh, improving their lives. Uh, so that's the responsibility we feel we need to take the leadership on to help the people in a remote area to do that. Um, the second thing we feel in this critical moment is really utilizing our uh, strengths to be a bridge to uh, bridge for the difference. Uh, no matter where I go, I lived in the USA in the Silicon Valley for about 15 to 20 years. I live in China, I was born in China. Uh, I also visited the refuge camp in the Middle East and visited the poor villages in Africa. No matter where I, went, where I go, people talk about very similar issues. We want our children to have good education. We want our young people to have good job opportunities. We want our family to have peaceful and happy lives because we share so much commonality. And I believe by bringing people together, letting them to see and witness what's really going on uh, in their country, in different country, will really bridge the difference rather than just listening uh, to hear say they say stress on the difference really doesn't help us in the pluralized world. But uh, bring people together is the way uh, really to uh, uh, foster the global peace and mutual understanding. 
Right. Um, Stefan, do you have any thoughts on what companies should do to try and step into that void? And I'd like to ask Derek that as well, about whether you think the companies actually have the resources, luxury of resources to focus on something other than the bottom line at the moment. But Stefan and then Derek. Yeah, I think you've started to see in the last few years uh, a big shift from being, you know, shareholder only focused to stakeholder focused. And as you know, in a lot of countries around the world, it's already the case. Uh, but in the US, you know, it was mostly, you know, shoulder focus. And and you see uh, that CEOs and boards are starting to realize that actually to drive long term shoulder value, you need to make sure you have an harmonious company uh, taking care of all the stakeholders in a way that makes sense and is consistent across those stakeholders. Uh, I think the companies have a big role to play in terms of employees, uh, not only compensation, of course, but also, you know, healthcare, education, development. In today's information age, it's all about learning and growing. Uh, you know, all of us know that you're not done learning when you leave college. It's just like one more day in your life, and it's about lo- lifelong learning. I think companies have a huge role to play uh, there. Uh, I talked earlier about the role that companies should have in the community, in terms of serving, engaging with a community, both uh, p- politically, but also socially. And then I think the environment, you know, this year we're all traumatized by COVID uh, because that's, of course, the crisis of a moment and we have to deal with this one. And and the collaboration that has happened around the world has been extraordinary. I've been in, in this industry for 25 years. I've never seen the level of collaboration between regulators like the FDA, but all the agencies around the world, the academic community and across industry. But the, the bigger crisis that's in front of us, and uh, we are literally boiling the planet, you know, slowly, but surely like, you know, in a in frog in a pan. Uh, and we as business have a huge responsibility to take in terms of how do we invest in our infrastructure? How do we educate our employees? How do we incentivize employees to change behaviors? You know, one of the silly things we do, for example, is, uh, you know, just charging stations for electric cars. Uh, incentives for people to take public transportation. There are so many things company can do. Same thing on the food front. Right. Food is very important for people's health, but as we know, food uh, has a massive impact on the planet. Uh, and I think changing our protein source uh, as, as a world is a very important piece we have to do. Uh, and I think the, the younger employees uh, are there before us. Uh, I have to say one uh, of the person that has the biggest impact on my thinking in the last five years, is my now 17-year-old daughter, who has been a vegetarian for 10 years, uh, who cares deeply about the planet, uh, animals, and it just helps you think differently. And I think all generations that are in leadership position now have to uh, stay open-minded, engage our younger employees, uh, engage our children to think about how to evolve, how we we run businesses, how to evolve as we live on this planet. Uh, Right. I think I'm going to have to cut you off there because we're a very short of time. And I do want to quickly bring in both Derek and David. Um, but I think the points you make are excellent. De- Derek, do you think companies have the luxury of resources to um, look at the issues about injustice and systemic racism that you've been um, highlighting? Well, is it a business, a business imperative? If you look at young Uh, people, young consumers, they are more socially aware and conscious than we've ever seen uh, in this nation's history and around the globe. The demonstrations this past summer, it looked like America. It was young, old, black, white, male, female. Those are the consumers of today and tomorrow. It is a business imperative. Secondly, uh, if you look at companies that have the triple bottom line or B Corps in the United States, uh, they are more stable than other countries because they care about consumers. They almost go back to Henry Ford, understanding that if he paid his workers more, they can buy more Model T cars. Therefore, as their quality of life grew, the company grew. It is vitally important to recognize that as the demographics of this nation change, as the demographics of consumers around the globe begins to shift and they have more resources, the companies that care about planet, people, and future opportunities will be the companies that that uh, that that activists, young consumers would truly invest in like a Ben and Jerry. So we have great opportunities to begin to refocus not on the politics of old, but the business imperative of the future. Well, we're just about out of time, but before I hand back to Richard, very quickly, David, 
want to ask you the question we all want to know right now is if we do start to build trust in our doctors and our vaccines, are you confident this is going to end in 2021? Will we be looking to brighter days um, by the summer? So one of the reasons why there is mistrust is because uh, political leaders and sometimes, I'm afraid, Gillian, journalists keep asking people like me when it's going to end. And we feel that we have to answer uh, in a way that sounds good because we understand that in the modern uh, era, particularly with social media so dominant, everybody would like to have good news to end the program. There's not good news to end this program, okay? This pandemic is set to continue. The virus will go on mutating. Variants that are more transmissible will continue to appear. They will become more and more dominant. More and more people will get ill. There are 90 million reported cases of COVID since it started. Two million approximately have died. Probably 30 million have got long-term COVID, which is going to give them real problems. Many of you know people who've got long COVID. Hundreds of millions of people are poorer. The world needs a concerted response. All CEOs of all vaccine companies, all G7 and G20 leaders need to get together at the beginning of February and say, we're going to work together to stop this. If they don't do, don't do so, and if we don't actually get the social media companies on side, our problem will be much, much worse. We must stop seeing the diffusion of unverified information deliberately to mislead and confuse. There's been too much of it, and it's causing people to get sick and die. If you didn't have companies putting around statements about masks not working, or social distancing not being necessary, or the pandemic being a fake, if we didn't have that sort of stuff, our problems would be nothing like as bad. I'm hopping mad because there are so many people dying unnecessarily because people like ourselves have not taken our responsibilities seriously enough. We have a global crisis on our hands. It needs everybody working together on it. It might come down to a reasonable level in 2022 or 2023, but the numbers of poor people who are going to suffer and die are just huge. And it's because the rich countries and the rich leaders have not taken their responsibilities seriously as world leaders. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. Normally at this point as a journalist, I try and sum up with a nice little kind of coda at the end. You know what, right now in today's world, I think the doctor should have the last word, not the journalist, given where we are with these challenges and this trust. We know that transparency and honesty is gonna be the first step to rebuild trust. So thank you, David, for your passionate appeal that I hope everybody who's watching listens and heeds and takes to heart. And on that note, I'm gonna hand back to Richard to wrap. Thank you. So um, Jillian, thank you for moderating a marvelous panel and especially for David's last contribution. I couldn't have a more important call to action for all of you who are on this uh, call and discussion. We have a moment here where we have an opportunity to change this situation. We've got to get people in corporate suites to recognize that the greatest risk of all is to keep your head down and not speak. We have to speak up now. We have to put quality information in front of our employees and get them to spread the information in the community. We have a disinformation epidemic. We have a twindemic between the pandemic and the information problem. We can solve the information problem. We can solve the pandemic. Thanks all for being on this call. Thank you all for um, being part of the broader Edelman family. And um, I appreciate deeply everything you do every day.